Hi, welcome back once again. I am, and to this point, have remained Pastor Kempfert, Pastor Jacob Kempfert. And as always, I'm here in my study at Gloria Dei Lutheran Church in beautiful Saginaw, Michigan. God's grace and peace to you today and throughout this week. And this week, we celebrated the second to last Sunday in the season of Epiphany. And this upcoming Sunday will be the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany, which in our church here is the festival of Christ's transfiguration, when his divinity shone forth on the mountain to uh, Peter, James, and John. And then uh, next week, we will begin the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. But for the time being, for the present moment, we are looking at the gospel uh, according to St. Luke chapter 6, where our Lord Jesus gives us a particularly difficult teaching for us to agree with and actively follow in our lives. We hear Christ's words from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Jesus said, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is the word of God. My dear fellow redeemed by the love of Christ. Today, Jesus asks us to do something that makes no sense to us. Love your enemies, he says. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. None of this comes naturally to us. We take it for granted that we ought to love those who love us. And we ought to do bad to those who have done bad to us. To curse those who curse us. To hate those who hate us. That just makes sense to us. Yet, Jesus is insistent when things don't make sense to us, and so he even takes it a step further. He says, if someone slaps you on one cheek, and I'm not going to do an active demonstration of that, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. So if someone came and took my new coat I got as a gift for Christmas. Uh, Jesus is saying, well, I should give my nice sweater to them as well. That would be very difficult for me, by the way. Jesus says, give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. So even if someone came in right now and took my coat and I gave them my sweater, I should not demand it back from them at any point. And the thing is, Jesus often uses metaphor and exaggeration in his teaching to make a point, but this is not one of those times. This is not metaphor or exaggeration. This is just plainly how Jesus desires his Christians to live. This Christian life on earth, then, can make very little sense to us at times. And so, at times, we have very great difficulty living according to it. If someone strikes us, we strike back. If someone takes something from us, we take back what's ours. That's just plain common sense. Yet Jesus says that what makes sense to us, what is common sense to us, is very often something people without faith do. 
it is something that makes sense to sinners. Jesus says even sinners love those who love them. And by sinners, he doesn't mean people, uh, he doesn't, he means people without the Christian faith, without righteousness declared to be theirs by faith. We who daily struggle against sin and temptation, we need a warning against what makes sense to our sinful, temptable flesh. Because scripture very rightly says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? So Jesus warns that heart of ours, watch out. If we desire retaliation, is it out of anger or hostility in us rather than inspired by God's righteousness and peace? If we desire the return of our property, is it out of selfishness and greed rather than out of the good stewardship and mercy that has been inspired in us by God's Spirit? If you call Jesus Lord and Savior, if you claim to follow him in faith but don't like what he has to say and think that you are exempt from living it, that you can nod your head to it in church but then go out and not have to actively live it, and then you can try to make excuses for why it doesn't apply to you, then how are you any more faithful than the faithless? How are we any more Christ-like than the enemies of Christ who do all these things. Later on in this chapter, near the end of his sermon here, Jesus tells us point blank, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What Christ says is very plain. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So why don't we? <laughs> Why do we instead come up with all sorts of excuses not to love someone? Excuses to curse instead of to bless. Excuses to rant and rave in our words and to simmer and seethe in our thoughts instead of just to pray. Why is that? I don't think it's as simple as it's, it's just the sinful flesh in our heart. Yes, that's true, but I think there's also a more specific problem. I think it's because we hear Christ's words and we do not take them to heart. We hear Christ's words, but we find them disagreeable and not worth living out. We hear Christ's words, but we don't believe them. After all, would other people, others, know that God is love by the way God's Christians treat them? Or would they instead come to the conclusion that God does not love anyone who is ungrateful, that God does not love unbelievers, that God does not love sinners, the unjust, the proud, the rude, that God does not love the unloving, that God simultaneously does not love those who test his patience and also does not love impatience. Yet if God does not love the ungrateful, the unjust, the proud, the unloving, the impatient, if God does not love sinners, then how could God love us? Then how could Jesus Christ love us and love us so much that he would lay down his life to save us? And if that's the case, then how are our sins forgiven? If he doesn't love us to do that, then how are we Christ's disciples? Then how could we ever love others in the first place? So we see that faith in Christ, trust in his word, and showing God's love daily in our lives of faith, they go together. They are inseparable. It takes a very loving person to love an enemy. It takes a very loving and patient person to bless someone when they have been cursed by them. And it takes real faith in Christ, real trust in his words to show love and generosity when we don't gain anything from it, when we even get hurt by it. But think of what Jesus gained by him sacrificing himself for our sake. Think of the hurt that he suffered in his act of love for us. And so, for this reason it is written, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, 
being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The quality of our love for others is an accurate reflection of how we believe God loves us. The extent that we are willing to be merciful to the unmerciful, to take pains to love those who do not love us, to actively show the grace of God to all those who are ungracious, this is a good indicator of our own faith in what Christ has done for us first. Faith that we are unloving, yet God loves us. That we ourselves are the lost sheep, the prodigal child, the poor and faithless servant. We are the sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God. Yet despite this, we are never, never beyond God's lavish grace. And that means neither is our ungracious neighbor. Because God's grace is of such a precious quality that he does not hate his enemies as we hate ours. Scripture says he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. And as it's written, God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God does not curse as we have cursed him, but instead he becomes the very curse for us in the person of Christ Jesus. As it's written, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And he redeemed us in order that the blessing would come to us through Christ Jesus so that we would receive the promised spirit through faith. And again, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Very clearly, God does not seek retribution for wrongs suffered, but shows compassion on those who have wronged him. And he shows this compassion in the passion he showed for us, in the passion he suffered for us, in the death that he died for us on the cross, in the death he destroyed for us in his resurrection from death. So if you lack love, if you lack trust that God will forgive you and give you his love despite all of your sins. Or on the other hand, if you easily see how God forgives your sins, but you can't understand how he could forgive certain sins of others, then return to the word of Christ. Return to that gospel of forgiveness and salvation, which alone has the power to strengthen your faith and fuel that love of God in us, which alone has the power to to show us the love God has for us and then empower us to give that same love to others. As it's written, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Return to that word because that word tells you again and again that the Lord of creation loves you and he loves you so much that he entered creation in the person of Christ Jesus in order to die for you. So that all your sins, which made, which made you God's enemy, would be paid for in full. They would be completely forgiven so that you would no longer be God's enemy, but his own beloved child. With God's word of love comes the very power to love. With the word of forgiveness comes the power of God to forgive. Because in that word, Christ himself dwells in us and abides with us in all things. So if you do lack love and you lack trust in God's love, then right now you're exactly in the right place, right here, listening to God's word, because that is the very word of God made flesh. If you do lack and tr- if you lack love and lack trust in God's love, then there's another place you can go to, And that is God's holy altar to the Lord's Supper, where the very body and blood of your Savior Jesus are given directly to you and placed on your lips in order to heal your wounds of lovelessness and doubt. There is the nourishment of the peace of God that he made for you.
in this word of God, in that sacred Lord's Supper, your Savior tells you, I love you so that you will not die. I will die and you will live. And though you suffer, I have suffered with you and I have suffered for you so that you will know peace with God and that in all things, God's peace will guard your heart. You are wounded by sin, but I do not condemn you for your wounds. I will be wounded with you and for you. I will be pierced to heal your wounds and restore your soul. None of your sin, no sin of yours will remain to condemn you because you have my own righteousness by the faith that I have given you. I do not condemn you. I forgive you. You are no longer my enemy. I am your friend. And you are my beloved saint. And if it makes no sense for me to suffer so much and sacrifice everything for those who will only hate me and ridicule me and persecute me and deny me, if such a love as that is foolish to you, then very well. I am a fool for your sake. And the foolishness of my love for you is wiser than any wisdom and stronger than any strength. So that you may be wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Love and faith go together. They are inseparable. And in telling us to love our enemies, Jesus is telling us to do something that doesn't make sense to us, something so difficult for us that it's impossible. It's so difficult that only God could accomplish it. But his love for us, his love for his enemies, his mercy and compassion is such that he did accomplish it. And he delivers it directly to us in his holy word and in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And he himself empowers us in these means of grace to love as he has loved us. As Jesus says to his disciples, as the Father has loved me, so also I have loved you. Remain in my love. I have told you these things so that my joy would continue to be in you and so that your joy would be complete. Love one another as I have loved you. The quality of our love for others, that's a good indicator of our trust that God loves us. The extent to which we are willing to forgive others, it's a good indicator of the trust we have that God has forgiven us. And God does love us, and God has forgiven us because we have the righteousness of Christ by faith. And because by faith we have that righteousness, we also have God's love for us and in us. And we can look, for a good example of this, we can look to how Christ's disciples in the early church received his words directly and put his love into practice. Because once they were convinced that the Lord of creation loved them enough to enter creation and die for them, they found that in the midst of all of the troubles they faced, and their troubles were certainly more numerous than ours today, in the midst of all the troubles they faced, they had the peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding, that that peace of God did guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that though they felt a world of sorrows, yet they had a world of joy beyond all sorrow from the life of the world to come. That though they were met only with ungracious hate, yet from them poured forth the pure love of Jesus that overcomes the world. You could persecute them and they would rejoice. You could torture them and they would walk away from it praising God. You could feed them to lions and they would die singing songs about their death right at that moment being swallowed up in Christ's victory experiencing the love of God caused them to see the world's hatred differently. Not as a wound to their pride demanding retribution, but rather as a wound of sin that can be healed and should be healed in the precious blood of Christ. Baptized into Christ's death and his resurrection, their hearts were already in heaven. 
They were not worried about who their enemies might be and why, or about what anyone might say or do to them, because their hearts dwelt in the richness of God's love, in the abundance of His forgiveness, in the blessing of His mercy. Even while on earth, they still dwelt in the triumphant glory of heaven. And the thing is, nothing that they had, that I've just described, is withheld from us. Because we have the same word of Christ. We have the exact same promise of Christ. We have the same Lord, the same faith, the same baptism. And we have that same eternity prepared for us. That eternity where we will see our same Savior face to face. And we will finally join with them and meet with the whole communion of saints around the heavenly throne. So now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. God grant this grace to us all. Amen.